Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. On the podcast today is the Dementia Nurse, also known as Gail Gail Weatherill. Thanks for being with me today, Gail. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk today on a topic called You Are the Expert. So I'm going to let you run with that one because I'm not feeling too experty at the moment. (laughs) You'll be all right one of these days. Someday. Um, You are the expert is one of my biggest messages for family caregivers of people living with dementia. Um, Because I find that something that people don't realize. They either don't realize it or they don't believe it or whatever. But it really is true. And um, part of that is because the healthcare profession, uh, professions have been woefully slow to really become familiar with the issue of dementia, whether that's Alzheimer's, frontotemporal, Lewy body, vascular, or any of the other types of dementia, which is why I call myself the dementia nurse and not the Alzheimer's nurse. Um, people want to talk about Alzheimer's, and I'm like, yeah, but you've left a big crowd of people out. So I, I like to focus on the general topic of dementia. Most cases are due to Alzheimer's, but we like to be inclusive. That is um, true. <laughs> yes. And just a quickie for my background. Um, I've been a registered nurse since dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> and um, I'm also board certified as an Alzheimer's educator. So as I tell my little grannies, don't worry, darling, I know everything. And what I don't know, I'm not afraid to make up. (laughs) So for the last 20 years, I've been working with uh, individuals and their families of people living with dementia. Um, I did that in home health. I was a director of nursing in a long-term care facility and various and assorted. I've I've worn several hats, but it's been in that same arena of geriatrics, and anybody working in geriatrics today is working in dementia care. Um, That's just pretty much the way that it is. Although it's not a geriatrics problem, um, as we're seeing more and more, unfortunately, uh, younger onset uh, cases, most of those are young onset Alzheimer's of people in their 60s, 50s, and even much younger than that. So, (laughs) back to you are the expert. Um, One of the things that I that I like to um, tell people is that, on average, by the time an individual has gotten a dementia diagnosis, whether it's Alzheimer's or another type, on average, they've had eight different encounters with a healthcare professional. Doctor's visits, testing, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it's not unusual for that to take place over about an 18-month period. Now, what other illness do you have to wait 18 months to get a definitive diagnosis? Not many. Um, so that is true. I had not thought it, about that. It, it is. And um, what I hear over and over from family caregivers, and I've seen it myself, is there's a tendency, you go to the doctor, I'm worried about this, blah, blah. Lots of people are told, oh, you're stressed. You know, your vitamin B levels low, your, you know, whatever. And it sort of gets blown off. Um, Part of that is because clinicians are not familiar, especially in primary care. Um, Part of it is because it is a diagnosis that nobody really wants to consider um, because of the long-term implications of that. And so I do think there's a reluctance among clinicians to go there um, because it's uncomfortable. The other thing is to set people up for the testing that's involved, et cetera, is a little more rigmarole 
than you can handle in a 15 minute office visit. So there's kind of a lot of factors that come together. And like I said, I mean, we know from data collected that um, by the time you get a diagnosis, most people have been through quite a process um, to get there. And that is the very beginning and should be the very first clue to um, family caregivers that they know a lot more about their loved one's condition than the doctor does. Um, Definitely. Yeah. I mean, you go into the doctor's office, um, things that I encourage people to do, keep records, get a calendar and track. On these days, he was really confused. On these days, he was clear as a bell. Um, video, if somebody's having episodes of, you know, extreme anxiety, personality changes, nothing like video and just shoot it with your phone um, and take it into the doctor. Once again, you're coming in with information for them and their role is to take the information you provide and assess it from a clinical standpoint and develop a treatment plan in conjunction with you and your loved one. Um, but you're the data collector. You're the day-to-day -day observer. And one of the things um, that that does is it means you always, it doesn't matter what doctor it is, what nurse it is, whomever, what social worker, you always are the person in the room who knows the most about your loved one. That is definitely true. That is definitely true. And that doesn't change as you progress in the disease. You will always be the most knowledgeable one about your loved one. And we hear, you know, if you've seen one case of dementia, you've seen one case of dementia um, because it's su such an individual thing. No two people seem to experience it just alike. So um, the people you're working with, the professionals, they have some information, they have some background, hopefully they have some knowledge. But once again, you're the most knowledgeable one in the room when it comes to your loved one. Um, one of the big practical applications of that is trusting your gut. Even when it goes against what a clinician's trying to tell you. Um, it doesn't mean you don't listen to them. It doesn't mean you'll always be right. But when people have a gut feeling about something or about someone that they spend 24 seven with, I will, I will bet my bottom dollar on that gut feeling before, you know, half a million dollars worth of scans and work up. Am I right, Jennifer? Oh, totally. I'm just trying to, determine how do you how do you like I, don't, I think doctors are almost trained not to trust our gut for lack right. of a better term so yeah. how do you how do you persuade them might be a proper term that they need to to really yes, listen to you is that just by presenting them with a a stack of data and video and notes maybe um any doctor that's not prepared to listen um, is not the doctor for you. That's and where I'm I at tell, right now. <laughs> I, I tell people that over and over and over again. I'm sorry, but except for in some really, really isolated rural areas, for the most part, you're not limited to whoever's been your family doctor for the last 30 years. It might be painful to make a change, but, you know, when a long-term chronic illness like brain disease that causes dementia comes into your life, one of the first things you're going to have to do is put together a team who are, who is 
going to be one of your helpers along the way? Who will the helpers be? And you have to have, you, you will save yourself so much angst and frustration and you will save your loved one a lot of angst and frustration by having a physician who will listen to what you have to say and it does i mean you know when you go to a doctor you know if he's listening to you you know if he's taking in what it is you're saying and considering that um so i always tell people if you've got somebody that's not listening that's not integrating that that thinks they know more about your loved one than you do it's time to say hmm i believe i'm going to open up this 15 minute spot for you on your next schedule because i'm going someplace else um that's where i'm at with my mom's yeah general physician yeah. But because she has gotten combative, I am trying to find a house call service. But right. we're out here in the yeah. suburbs, and yeah. a lot of them would just like to stay in San Francisco, which yeah. is way too far. So I'm I'm not having a lot of success yet. I'm still working on it. Right. Um, you might want to think about calling some of the home care companies in the area because sometimes those nurses or the clinical supervisors there may know of physicians that do uh housebound calls that you might not know about or you might not you know ordinarily they don't have it particularly advertised um yeah, i'm not doing too well with google which you know that's kind of a shock yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like wait a minute i thought google no, knew say, everything yeah. <laughs> I, I can tell you how many feet a uh you know are on a whatever, but I can't tell you which doctors around here might come to my home. That's why I tell people I you know call the people that might know, and the first ones that come to my mind are people who work in in home health. Yeah, that's um, an excellent suggestion, and it's not that her general physician doesn't listen, right? I, and I and I've tried to remind him, you know, in a polite kind of like a, hey, by the way, did you know kind of affect uh -huh. is that through Medicare and through the, you know, the Alzheimer's Association pushed this, he, there is a billing code for spending time on a cognitive assessment. Now my mom's cognitive assessment is, you know, yeah. <laughs> thumbs down, but he yeah. just, the, the biggest example is she fell, she ended up with seven stitches, and I could not get anybody to take them out. I was like, what, this woman's going to die with these stitches permanently in? And what happened with him, and he was not the first one to fail me, but he should have mm -hmm. been better, was he pointed him out, and she looked at him, and she goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> Which I was like, ooh, there's some Truthful, truth. Truthful, set you free. Yeah, and I was, you know, and, and I, I didn't say anything. And he looked at me and I said, I kind of, you know, I said, that's what we're Welcome dealing with. And he said, well, he literally shrugged his shoulders and said, do you think you could take them out? And I said, oh, well, my God. oh it gets I'm better. So I said, well, I guess I don't have much choice, but I have lazy eyes. So I have no depth perception. Maybe I can get my next door neighbor who's a nurse to help me. And that's exactly what we ended up doing. My mom had those stitches for 42 days. And I'm like, come on, I'm a podcaster and a photographer. I, I am not a medical person. I don't even want to deal with that. Well, you know, that just brings up one of the big, you know, <laughs> barriers, one of many hurdles that caregivers face is that the system expects caregivers to deliver some pretty complex care with no training you know i mean you get three minutes before the hospital discharge as the nurse rushes in and says okay we got to go over this blah blah here are your medicines you got to do this you got to do that mm -hmm, sign here adios hurry up you know somebody's waiting on the bed that is the rule more than the exception 
So when it comes, I mean, you know, that is insane asking a family member to take stitches out. That's just, you know, yeah, I mean, he, I'm sorry, that's nothing but laziness because there are other ways to accomplish that. At the same time, that's an excellent example to that physician of what kind of challenges you're facing at home. Oh yeah, you we had to medicate her. Pardon? We had to medicate her. I had to. I yeah. I like her well, neurolog. I like her neurologist, so I sent the neurologist a message that explained the situation, and I said I need whatever it was mm -hmm. drug you gave me or gave her mm -hmm. gave me to give her before we did her her last MRI mm -hmm. because yeah. the only other option is to have like four people hold her down. Right. And I'm right. not doing that. Yeah. You know, you're the woman right, will die with stitches correct. in. But, I mean, my neighbor was even willing to deal with it. She's like, well, maybe we can just have somebody hold her down. I'm like, oh, it's going to be more than one somebody. Yeah. She, said, she screams, she swears, calls people names. I mean, a couple weeks ago, she got mad at me. She told me to drop dead and referred to me as a female dog and, you know, yeah. all kinds of lovely. So you can imagine yeah. if somebody's holding her down on a bed. Right. Coming with, at her with a pair of scissors and tweezers. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's going to say, oh, look. She's you know, that, coming over to love on me. I think I'll lay nice and still here and let her do what she needs to do. Yeah. All right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, was, I wasn't even going to attempt that. I didn't. Yeah. You know, they remember. Well, you were the, smart. You, you handled it perfectly. I mean, that should be the thing if there's going to be something like that they need medication it's not safe to just let them thrash oh no and um, she scratches yeah she's drawing blood on caregivers and my husband yeah, i was and... gonna say somebody, somebody's going down and it probably ain't gonna be her you know <laughs> <laughs> that's how that usually goes that is very true and so that was my frustration and that's hasn't been that long ago right and I have less than zero appeal to go back to him because yeah. it's like, dude, you, you, you've you yeah. made my life difficult. You've made her yeah. life more difficult. And I'm sorry, Alzheimer's, that should qualify you for everybody trying to make it as easy as possible. Exactly. You know, it, like, it was just like, I wanted to punch him. <laughs> That's probably not smart either. So yeah. I am trying to find better solutions, but, it, you know, at the same time, she, it's, you know, just getting her into the car, out of the car, into the doctor's office is oh, enough yeah. stress that by the mm -hmm. time we get to the doctor, she's not super, uh, you know, what's the right, right. word? Uh, uh, ah, the word has slipped my mind. <laughs> she's not amenable to a pleasant conversation. Could that be it? Yeah, well, she's just not, you know, she's not interested in being super cooperative. You know, right. because she doesn't, yeah. she doesn't understand why she's there. She doesn't think anything's right. wrong with her. They don't know why they're there. The, they have no concept of time. So in their mind, they've been sitting there for two days, even if it's been 15 minutes. And then this idiot, you know, <laughs> she probably wasn't that far off the mark, comes in and, you know, is talking a mile a minute and blah, and blah. And then you're talking and it's confusing. Um, it's no fun for for either of you um, and i'm sure it wasn't great for him either you know i can't imagine that yeah, he yeah. he left that exam room feeling like well that was that was an accomplishment <laughs> you know i mean it was like this is what i went into medicine yeah. for <laughs> probably not yeah so it's like okay that seemed like a all the way around lose situation yeah and that, yeah that is it lose 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 all three of you but i just so. don't feel like i have the time to to educate him and i've tried i've i've basically said you know you need to you need to talk a little bit slower you know don't ask two or three questions in a row you know and he's not that old i mean he's her yeah, previous the, yeah. his her previous physician he was a character he was from scotland so he had a very thick accent mm -hmm. which i'm surprised she could understand him and he had long hair, you know, shoulder length hair. I mean, he was just a character. Was, uh -huh. I mean, I, I did like him a lot. And he left the practice and I chose this nurse practitioner because I find them to be far superior to doctors most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And every time I need to bring mom in, she's not available. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? That's because so, everybody else has figured out they're far better than that. That's true. <laughs> she's booked up. Um, 
yeah i i would just encourage you as you're doing to to look for somebody else because that that's you can't you can't survive this journey without i mean having a physician whether it's their primary care physician a neurologist a uh, geriatric psychiatrist you have to have somebody or an you know with either mb or nurse practitioner behind their name as a partner on this adventure um it's just critical and that's one of the reasons i'm always beating the drum of with caregivers is you are the expert you are the expert because what happens is when people are treated badly or they are not served well by the healthcare system there's a tendency to think oh well i guess they know they must know what they're doing or maybe it was i mean i hear that all the time and i'm like no don't assume they know what they're doing <laughs> you know and bring your gut with you when you go there um so well i have a quick story that outlines the it outlines very well why you should take notes there's a mm -hmm. gal her name is jean lee and she mm -hmm. is one of the founding mothers daughters women of all's authors mm -hmm. and she kept a notebook of she was caring for her parents and she was keeping a notebook of day-to-day -day things mm -hmm. so she could inform her sister who lived a thousand plus miles away mm -hmm. and being in the thick of caring there was a lot of things that she kind of normalized for lack of a better right. term exactly. and when she would go back to the notes and read them to her sister it was you know it was almost like being smacked upside the head with the book and yeah. she had that to take to the doctor which helped a lot and mm -hmm. after her mother passed away she actually wrote a book she reached yeah. out to another gal who had written a book and long story short five of the, i think it was five of them four or five yeah. women started all's mm -hmm. authors and right. so there's two good reasons to keep notes but the the my main point is is that you know when you're in the thick of something it becomes right. more normalized you know the the re yeah. repetitive questions or what right. any of the normal cognitive impaired behaviors you know like right. my my neighbor was having you know brain glitches like her husband was getting very concerned about her memory and mm -hmm. she was like oh i'm just tired i'm just straight blah 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 the same kind of yeah. excuses yeah. that people give and i pulled him aside i'm like that is how my mother started yeah i'm gonna keep yeah. my eye on her now thankfully in her case she was stressed she, yeah. she does a tremendous amount of stuff for her family and she works full time so uh, you know she yeah. this has been many years since this conversation and she has not had any other issues other than that one time so thankfully right. she did not seem to have early alzheimer's at that point but yeah. you know i let him know that that yes she could yeah. be t start tired and stressed right but it also could be an indication there are of, other possibilities yeah so like i said thankfully it was it was just tired <laughs> <laughs> it was just time. That's good. Yeah. I um actually speaking of books, um, I had one come out in January, The Caregiver's Guide to Dementia. Um, practical advice for caring for yourself and for your loved one. And one of the things that I talk about in there and that I go through is putting together a notebook where you have certain documents where you can make notes, you can keep a list of current medications and when they've been changed etc and it just makes life easier um, to have that where you can just grab it and go um you know you don't have to try to remember did we change the aricep in february or was it was it november <laughs> you know you don't anything you can write down is one more thing you don't have to remember in your head so i'm i'm a big proponent of that i think it makes life easier well it's hard it's hard to share what's in your head if you're not there if yeah. something happens to you 
it'd be nice that other people can pick up the book. You know, there's you yeah. know the notebook, whatever. It's yeah, information yeah. is power. <laughs> Just... Exactly. And who in the room has the most information about your loved one? Me. <laughs> that would be you. I.e., you are the one in control. You are the expert in your loved one. I'm an expert in brain failure and dementia in general. I'm not an expert in your loved one. You are. Um between the two of us, we could definitely figure out a few things, but um, people just need to realize that um, doctors, nurses, hospitals are working for them. They work for you. And if you're not getting what you need, then you are perfectly entitled to speak up. Um, they and didn't depending like it on the response you get, <laughs> if you don't get a good response, mm, well, then you got to think, okay, are they having an off day or is this pretty much how this person operates? And if it is, then, you know, you don't need to waste your energy trying to educate or change someone. You, you got other fish to fry. You don't have time and emotional energy for that. You should not be the one that needs to educate them. They need to be getting themselves educated. Anyway, well, definitely, not that I feel strongly about any of that, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with that. It frustrates me tremendously. And it's one of the reasons why I'm a legislative advocate, volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association. That is a very big mouthful. Because I think, especially because we're at the beginnings of what is um, obviously going to become a very big, much bigger problem. Right. They need a lot more general knowledge so that when I come in and I shouldn't have to say, you know, speak slower. Don't ask my mom three questions in a row. I'm like, yeah. does it look like I'm here? You know, I, the a perfect example is she needed blood work for something. I've forgotten why now. And so we go to the blood lab and I check her in and I, I tell the gal, you know, mom's got advanced Alzheimer's cause they never read the chart, which it should uh -uh. be. A God forbid that they would know anything. It yeah. should just be like a giant red sticker on the front of a chart yeah. because they shouldn't yeah. have to sift through it to find it. Right. And I, it just makes me crazy. So I told the gal, you know, my mom's got advanced Alzheimer's. She doesn't wait patiently. Doesn't look like that's going to be a problem, but I'm just letting you know because, you know, if we wait we too long, it gets ugly. Way. Yeah. And so there literally was one guy sitting in the waiting room. I don't even know what he was doing because he got up and left and probably left his iPad on the chair. So, and we were the only other two people in there. So we go into the blood draw room and she goes, now, can you tell me your last, your name and your birthday? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, Ooh, I barely yeah. understood that. And yeah. I just looked at her and I said, no, she can't. And the girl yeah. looked at me. She had to be in her mid to late 20s. And she just looked at yeah. me like, huh? And I'm like, what the hell do yeah. you think is advanced Alzheimer's means? Uh, you know? yeah. yeah. That's like, you know, my favorite in the hospital. The nurse is there and she's like, okay, now if you need anything, just push this button right here. And I'm like, please, please. Or you know, I I actually was in the ER with a lady that I work with just a couple of weeks ago. And I mean, what I do is, A, I carry little business cards that say, my companion today is living with dementia and, you know, needs more time, blah, blah, just a little something. I didn't have any cards on me that night. So I had written it on a big piece of paper that I could hold up behind her head whenever somebody was talking to her. Um, I can so picture that. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. And I was like, they were going to have to transfer her over to the hospital from the satellite ear. And I'm like, every person that comes in contact with her had better know because this woman, I mean, she has no short-term memory whatsoever. But other than that, I mean, she can carry on a perfectly normal conversation other than asking the same thing every, you know, 30 seconds. But, 
you know, people in healthcare, it's almost like unless a person is drooling and slumped over in a chair, which is their perception of this is, you know, this is Alzheimer's or this is dementia. If somebody can carry on a conversation, they'll just assume that what they're telling them is accurate. And I'm like, mm, yeah, well, not so much, not so much. Not yeah, that, that reminds me of every time the doctors say, ask my mom, well, are you, because ha she's had a lot of pain walking. Now she mm -hmm. fell on December 30th, okay. this past year, 2019. And nobody knows why. She's never been a fall risk. She hasn't fallen before or since. So yeah. Lord only knows what caused it. And she's had a lot of pain with walking since then. But that may, may be why she fell. Because she, they're saying that she has arthritis in her hips. Yeah. Well, they talk to her. They're like, are you having pain? And she literally looks at him like, are you an idiot? She goes, no, I'm fine. And they take that yeah. as face value. I'm like, yeah. she yeah. doesn't know what she's saying. Which, yeah. you know, I have to kind of whisper carefully because... Right. You know, yeah. I, I mean, like, that's, you know, yeah, that's why I'm over here with the sign behind the woman's head. I mean, you don't want to go, hmm, over here, this one, see this one? Yeah, it's like, you know, Do I need to put a big, you know, scarlet letter, A for Alzheimer's? Yeah, maybe um, they need to wear t-shirts or something. Or they need hospital gowns that say Alzheimer's on them, which <laughs> is probably a HIPAA violation or something. I don't know. Uh, uh, they they can have ones that say unreliable historian. Um, <laughs> That's a much kinder term. Which is a nice way of saying don't believe a word they say. <laughs> that is very true. Now I have a question for you. The day that mm -hmm. my mom fell, the care home called, and this is this is a problem with computers. We were talking about how great technology was earlier. Uh, a year ago, I disconnected my home landline. I still have a business mm -hmm. landline. I disconnected the home landline because yeah. we were spending like 60 bucks a month to have the yeah. robo calls and the solicitors harass yeah. the crap out of us. I'm like, this is stupid. I'm, I'm paying good money to be harassed. This is, this yeah. is not smart. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. And I'm, I took that phone number off mom's chart. And mm -hmm. of course the day she falls, that's the phone number they somehow found. Yeah. So because, you know, heads bleed like stuck pigs, yeah. I've never stuck a pig. So I can't, test to that accuracy you know out of an abundance of caution they sent her to the er uh -huh. well now the er ended up doing a cat scan now i'm her healthcare power of attorney and it really irritates me nobody from the hospital called me nobody called to say hey should we do this i don't know how much thousand dollars the whole uh -huh. overall bill was ele over $11,000 essentially for an old lady with Alzheimer's to fall down, cut her head, and get seven stitches. I'm like, this that is immoral. we're going to stay in for 42 days. Yeah, that I had to arrange to have removed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, healthcare system. Yeah, you know, every time I hear people say, you know, we got our, our political thing going on with the health care. And I don't know that, I don't know what's better or worse, but something's got to be better than what we're doing. But should the yeah. hospital have called me? Well, the ER, I should say, you know, because I realize an ER is probably different than if she had been actually admitted. Uh, <laughs> it kind of depends. First of all, the... Um, facility the care home where she was i can guarantee you that in your state the regulations dictate how much time they have to contact you not to leave a message on a dead phone but to for someone to speak with you so that they know you have the information there's a certain number of hours a lot of places it's within four hours which is too big a window but that's another um that's probably about the like window that when they come i can tell you my guess is that you didn't get a call because they were in a hurry because they looked and they saw exactly what you just said an old woman with alzheimer's who fell and needs some stitches so they don't want to fiddle foots around they don't want to take the time to call they want to just okay well you know we need to see if her head's all right because she fell let's see if she's got a bleed send her down there it, it's 
it's a um, an assembly line process. Get them in, get them out. And stopping, trying to find a phone number, then you got to talk to them, then they're going to ask 20 questions, then they're going to tell you stuff you really don't need to know. Or I could just go ahead and order it because we know we're going to need it anyway, and zippity doo da zippity day, which is one of the reasons that um, I do everything in my power to keep people with dementia away from hospitals because they are very dangerous places for people with memory impairment. Well, I can totally attest to that. My father had kidney failure and was not interested in going back on dialysis. He had a donated mm -hmm. kidney that he, he didn't lovingly care for well, and it was failing and he determined he was not going back on dialysis, which is fine. I had no yeah. problem with that. What I did have a problem with is he didn't bother to tell us we were at that point. We show up, and he thinks it's 1998. And it was like all head panic because now I got two parents with no brains. And uh, he was in the hospital for 32 days and he didn't understand why and why they kept doing dialysis on him when his nephrologist, which for those people who aren't all dialed in on these terms, that's a kidney doctor. Why she, she kept saying, you know, once we get his, the toxins cleaned out of his system, his memory should return. Well, that was a bunch of hooey. So I figured if that didn't happen within two or three days, it wasn't right. going to happen. Exactly. Well, yeah. I was right. You know, I, 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 my sister, I'm more of a negative personality. I, I try to fight that. <laughs> my sister, my sister was very hopeful and I didn't want to uh, squat on yeah. that hope because that's just mean. But yeah. you know, long story short, he ended up home on hospice right. and he just thought he was getting over the flu. So I can tell you, I mean, they actually had to put the, the zippered cage thing, I know that's not what they call it, around the bed because he was being a pain in the butt. Right. Because he didn't yeah. know what was going on. And it's so just he like, went through over a month of torture for him and the people who love him mm -hmm. for no good reason. No good reason whatsoever. Yeah, from November. Except no the incompetence uh, of a physician. I don't think and it was incompetence. Was, I think you? it was I don't think it was incompetence. I think it was jacking up the bill. Well, that is a form of incompetence in my mind. Yeah, that's true. I mean, incompetence comes in many forms. Um, people who can't, physicians who can't deal with hospice because in their mind, it's a failure on their part. Um, I worked intensive care for 17 years. And when I finally left, a newspaper reporter asked, why are you leaving after all this time? I said, because I'm tired of sticking needles in dead people. Um, <laughs> There's a quote. <laughs> there, I was going to say, I just threw that in, no extra charge. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it ended up on the front page of a very large newspaper in Virginia. Um, yeah, I was really popular after that. <laughs> But the point is, I mean, my point was that treatment decisions are often driven by the biases of whoever's writing the orders. And they will deny it until they're blue in the face that, you know, no, that's not what's happening here. But I'm like, sorry, bub. I've been watching this for 17 years and I know exactly what's going on here, whether you're aware of your bias or not yeah so. i've actually experienced it because mom went to the er i had her at the urgent care then i had her at the eye doctor for another issue back at urgent care there was oh. one of oh and the neurologist and so then we been end up back at him the day that he refused to take out the stitches and i said this is my fourth time trying to get some of this stuff taken care of well you haven't come to see me and it was all I could do not to say, dude, <laughs> oh. the reason I haven't called you is because I like to get things done. Get in. I was pretty sure it. this was going to be the outcome. And am I leaving here as a result of seeing you with my problem solved? <laughs> nope. Mm -hmm. Now that you mention it, no. So I have one other question. Um, I am working... I need to make a call, a couple calls, and put my mom on palliative care. But one mm -hmm. of my other decisions 
is mm -hmm. to change her pulse form from whatever they call it when it's the middle stage, not to do dramatic interventions, but some to just comfort care. Right. If mm -hmm. so comfort care, well that, and I do have to make an appointment. It's like, I have all these things to do for my mother. And it's like, Lord, I have my own stuff to take care of. It's um, a full time. Yep. And she's in a care facility. It's like, right. hello. Yeah. I thought that would be easier. It's not. It's, That's it. And I always tell people, don't think just because your loved one moved into a facility that your caregiver days are over. You know. I mean, they could be, but. They, I, well, they morph. They look different, but. Yeah. Well, I guess I could about, walk away, but that's not about my the post orders. Yeah. If so, if I when I switch it to comfort care, which I would have already done, except I need a different doctor to sign the stupid thing. Um, will that tell in general? And like I said, I need to talk to the executive director of where mom lives. Tell them don't call the e, don't call the ambulance when she bumps her head. No. Okay. Um, you need something specific. Um, one of the things that I always encouraged families to do when I was working at uh, the facility, uh, I would tell people, you know, you have the option of asking the physician to write an order. Do not hospitalize, do not, you know, send to the ER without consulting the POA. That is excellent information I needed to know. Yes. Um, and the other thing that that will do is they'll probably try just a little bit harder to reach you. If they're sitting there and, you know, she's got a little gusher and a goose egg <laughs> and, and there's an order on the chart that says she doesn't move until you give express consent for that specific incident. Um, and all he has to do is write it as do not hospitalize without um, a new directive from the POA, i.e. they have to talk to you without your direct consent uh, for that tells me episode. That, that's going to be a challenge to get a doctor to write. Well, then you need a new doctor. Well, I need a new doctor to start with. So, boy, that's going to be like a, hey, hello, I'm glad to meet you. And uh, here's the forms I want you Let to sign so yeah, I don't ever yeah, have to come yeah. back. Re <laughs> well, you know what? The other thing you can do is walk in with a doctor and say, you know, these are the kinds of, this is the approach I'm interested in. This is the approach that, that best matches my mother's wishes. So I need to know up front, are you comfortable with following this type of treatment? That's also so, excellent. Yeah. So he can say yes or no. The other thing that I would, um, sometimes it's easier to get them to write just a plain do not hospitalize order, um, which is also an option. And that was generally how we used to handle it. I'd tell family, I said, you know, and I worked with a physician. We had a physician that came into the facility who was a geriatric specialist. She was absolutely top notch. Um, there are pockets of excellence out there, but you have to go find them. But with her, she would, you know, she would write, do not hospitalize. So if there was an event that the staff felt really you know like if she was gushing blood or if she had fallen and most likely had a broken hip and there's an order do not hospitalize they're going to make two calls they're going to call the physician and they're going to call the poa and once again the decision gets made in the context of that specific incident that makes what sense because the the hospital you know they have the er and like right next door is the urgent care well i think it's on the other side of the building but you know yeah. we're talking yeah. you know <laughs> we're nitpicking there and it's like i don't know i mean i guess if she had a brain bleed they could have done surgery which i wouldn't have approved anyway so i'm not right. sure why they felt it necessary unless they had zero clue what was wrong with her and they thought this woman's a babbling idiot what's wrong with her which is right. very likely 
you know, if they, yeah. if the care facility had gotten a hold of me, I probably would have said, can you transport her to the urgent care and I will meet you there? Yeah. Cause it happened to be a Monday, which is the day I visit anyway. Yeah. And yeah. It happened really early in the morning and they got a hold of me before lunch. So it was probably within that four hour window. Yeah. Um, and it was the executive director who ended up calling. Right. And you know, right. I don't yeah. have any problem with what they did. I just, it's right. like, I don't want her sent to the ER and then admitted without my permission. And then I got to fight with them to get her out right. because which is what happens. I mean, when, boy, I'll tell you, when we had anybody in the hospital, I was over there every single day. Okay, what are you doing that we can't do at home? You know? Yeah. Because uh, it's, uh, you know, a hospital's a place to get sick these days. Especially right now. <laughs> yeah, you ain't lying there, sissy. Lord have mercy. Yeah, I was uh, scheduled to do a, go to a dementia care workshop. And I got a phone call. It was put on through the city and the Alzheimer's, well, no, the city and a couple other people, not the uh -huh. Alzheimer's Association. And they called today, the city called today, and they said, oh, we're postponing it because of the coronavirus. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> there's a, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff getting canceled. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday that had a big conference they were going to in Florida. Nope. Mm -mm. they weren't going to have that many people in one place mm, well, i'm going to a conference in denver shortly i'm a little bit nervous about flying but i'm i'm younger ish and healthy yeah, yeah. so you know i'm yeah. not a senior citizen right getting right. you know technically getting closer but <laughs> i always tell people age is relative because my grandmother will be 102 on march 28th that's right baby you, you're still a teenager yeah here. it's like you know, compared to that i'm like a kid so um, it's just, you know, it's just interesting because I'm, I'm trying not to worry about it, but I do worry yeah. a little bit about the care home. Right. I don't know. That's the, the and that it, I mean, you're not, um, off the wall worrying about that. That, that is one of the biggest challenges, especially on the West coast where you are. Um, and I think the first, um, death from the virus in California was a gentleman that lived in a care home yeah, or was in yeah. a nursing home. One of those two things. So, right. and I, I need to dial in all this medical care stuff because I have no plans to intervene. If she gets right. coronavirus, it's hospice. She gets pneumonia. It's, right. I mean, it's like she gets anything. It's hospice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> because yes. that's what she'd want. And it's hard. I, I say that, you know, just, you know, like I'm ordering a sandwich for lunch, but, and I don't think it'll be that easy when the time comes. I, I will, my, my husband knows that he will have to be strong for me to pull that yeah. trigger, yeah. but that's, you know, yeah. why would you, there's a gal in my support group mm -hmm. whose husband is getting very um, abusive and combative. Yeah. My mom is getting combative too, but thankfully I'm stronger and we're the same height. He's much taller than she is. Right. And he ended up in the ER and with pneumonia. And I was like, why did you, you should have just gave him a big kiss and let him go. Yeah. Now, I understand with them, it's religious and that's understandable, but only to a certain point for some of us. Yeah. Well, even for, let me tell you, I'm, I'm, uh, most of, a lot of my work is faith-based and frankly i have a lot of conversations with people helping them understand that um god gave us technologies and medications and everything else for certain reasons prolonging suffering i'm pretty sure is not what he had in mind that is true Doctors um, and and technology are not God, so stop trying to intervene. Right, right. In the well, normal I mean, course in of the, in the old days, they used to call pneumonia the old man's friend. That's what it was known as, and it makes perfect sense. It comes on fairly quickly. If you don't treat it, it's a relatively short period of time of acute illness, and then. 
you go to sleep. It's just got to be a lot better than dying from Alzheimer's. Well, most people who die from Alzheimer's are, I don't know if I should use the word most, but a very big percentage of people who die from Alzheimer's die from pneumonia because they lose their swallowing reflex. They can't protect their airway. So secretions or food or whatever goes into their lungs and they develop an aspiration pneumonia. And that's what takes them out. Um, the other biggie is people get a urinary tract infection. Um, and then the bacteria get seeded into the bloodstream, carried to the vital organs, which begin to fail from that bacterial attack. But either one of those scenarios, if they're handled properly, can be a short-term illness. People can be kept comfortable. It, you know, it, it isn't a big nightmare, you know, in the ER. They don't know why they're there. They don't know, you know, who is this idiot stabbing me with <laughs> knives and whatever else. I mean, that's the alternative. What's the alternative? That's the alternative. And um, in a, I'll just real quickly mention, since you uh, brought that up, doctors will ask the wrong question. They'll say, what do you want us to do? That's the wrong freaking question. The question needs to be, what do you think your mother would tell us if she were magically for 10 minutes in her right mind, understood her situation, understood her prognosis? What do you think she would tell us to do? Um, that's the question because that's called self-determination. I mean, there are federal laws to protect self-determination. Nobody else has the right to decide how I'm going out of here. Not my beloved children, not a spouse of 70 years. Nobody. It's up to me. So it's not, you know, what does Jennifer want? It is exactly how you expressed it, which was beautiful. You said, that's what my mother would want. And that's, you know, we don't have the right to usurp what they would want. We that really don't. True. I mean, it, and it's unethical and immoral. And that's, you know, some of that is written into federal law. Well, I think the question is, what do you want us to do? The answer, nothing, doesn't feel or sound right. They don't want to hear it. You don't want to say it. Yeah. So maybe, you know, like I was saying earlier, I might waffle a little bit and say like, well, uh, you know, my, if my husband wasn't there to say no, mom yeah. would want X, we're going to do X. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the doctor saying, well, you know, and then jumping in with a, well, if we just give her some antibiotics or we just do, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's complicated. And that is, I mean, I see that all the time and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I would, you know, boy, I'll tell you what, my children know what to do and what not to do. And they've been threatened with being haunted the rest of their natural born days if they dare to take um, another tact with it. I'm laughing because my husband is an, is an only child. We have one daughter and I have said it'd be pretty much the same thing. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I had told my husband because my Great, my maternal great grandmother had quote senile dementia. That's what they called it way back in the day. She, yeah, she yeah. died before I was born, which for regular listeners should pretty much know that was November of '66. My maternal grandmother had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. Now she ended up in the same general state as my mom is now so i don't know right. if that was all aneurysm related or she right. did have undiagnosed dementia we'll never know and then there's my yeah. mom so i have told my husband if i get to a point where i cannot assist in my care it is yeah. time for the permanent night night pill and he has told me i don't think i could do that i don't think i could do that and i've told the daughter you better be able to stand up and do this and she's assured me that she could just off me pretty easily, which is pretty funny. <laughs> but the day that my mom clawed my husband and drew blood, he looked at me and he said, 
that packed you wanted, you're on. And I was like, oh, that sounds yeah. like I better not go to sleep tonight. <laughs> really? Hey. Well, well, We've been I mean, that's the beauty of just having those discussions at a time when you're not under the gun. Exactly. You know, and hopefully I, I eat right, I exercise, I get good sleep, I try to keep my yeah. stress low. You know, I do everything yeah. that they tell you you should do. Yeah. I had to learn a lot, do a lot of, um, yeah. what do they call that, um, active learning when I started yeah. podcasting. So it's like, I've done everything. Yeah. To avoid that path, I take after right. my dad's side of the family, which is yeah. diabetes and fat gene. I don't have diabetes. <laughs> I did have, I do have the fat gene. I have to battle that every day. Uh, so I'm hoping that I don't take after my mom's side of the family because, uh, you know, three generations is enough. I'll tell you. Uh, so, and hopefully, you know, God forbid I end up like my mom. Maybe the medical professional will have wised up by then. Well, that's why I am so fast and furious trying to educate as many people as I can, including healthcare professionals, because I just ain't that far away from the big, uh, big risk group. Um, age is the biggest risk factor for developing dementia. And so I am frantically going, you know, I've got to sort this out, honey, because I, 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 I ain't having this. Yeah, it's like my, my daughter and I were discussing the recent primary election, and we have different candidates of choice. Hers is still in, mine is gone. And yeah. she's like, well, we need, med she goes, I want to see Medicare for all in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, she's 28. She has Crohn's disease, so she has uh, a chronic illness. And yeah. so she's much more invested in right. medical care than the normal 28-year-old. And I said, honey, I'm, I'm all there with you on that, but yeah. I'm not sure it'll happen in my lifetime. And I'm 53, yeah. so <laughs> yeah. I might yeah. have another 49 years if I live as long as my paternal grandmother. Lord hey, it ain't so, Joe. <laughs> I'm like, man. Ooh, hey, Nana says getting old is not for wimps. That's a fact. That's a fact. That's but, why we um, all have to do everything we can to rally around and and put our our team together so that we don't yes. have the, you know, I don't feel like murdering doctors. Right. That stress is not good for me. <laughs> <laughs> no good will come of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought well, I'd outgrown those murderous tendencies, but they've come back. <laughs> exactly. Well, luckily, I mean, there's a lot that people can do. There are a lot of resources out there. Educating yourself, knowing where to find that information, who to believe, who to, you know, don't listen to whatever, because there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, that is, is true. The biggie. And, and just people knowing you have options, even when it feels like you don't. And that goes back to the fact that you know more about your loved one you are the expert in your loved one's dementia so you just gotta keep that in mind that is true stick with it